Welcome to Dissecting IoT for the Rural Broadband Ecosystem. Today's speakers are Andy Hines, Director of Strategy Operations for Finley Engineering, and Peter Denaghy, founder of IoT America. Established in 1953, Finley Engineering is a multidisciplined organization offering professional engineering and consulting services to the broadband, IP, and electric power industries. Finley operates nationwide, implementing projects coast to coast. You can find out more information about Finley on our website at www.finleyusa.com. Today, we will discuss network planning that prepares service providers for IoT opportunities. We'll explore IoT use cases for agriculture, smart towns, education, and telehealth. And finally, we'll add clarity to the IoT opportunity for service providers serving rural markets. Please welcome Andy Hines with Finley Engineering. I'll roll through a few just infrastructure items here, um, kind of set the stage for Pete a little bit uh, to get down to some brass tacks on IoT. But I guess as we get started, what um, what what is iot and i guess conceptually it is is connecting um, any device uh, to the internet or other devices for interaction and you know, historically we've had devices that gather information um, whether on a network or even in a closed system um, but that's kind of been somewhat limited in what those those uh, applications did with the data um, you know when in looking at IoT and really, you know, talking to Pete and others is that, you know, with IoT, it's really taking that data and making it actionable. And if we're gonna make it actionable, we have to have, have more communication either to the cloud um, for servers, for, an, for analytics to be run or interaction with, with other devices. So in order to make that connectivity work, um, you know, what, what does that infrastructure look like? What are some of the requirements? Again, we're not going to go really deep, but we'll, we'll peel back a little bit of the onion um, and, and look at at least some of the considerations when we're looking at the network planning piece of things. Um, so we all know infrastructure um, is pretty much just the underlying foundation or basic framework of any system. Um, and we know that that infrastructure when we're talking large systems can be um, some fairly large investments. So just grab some numbers from, you know, the from media here in the last couple of years in in seven in 2017 uh, Deloitte undertook a study that that pegged um, an investment of somewhere between 130 and 150 billion in fiber to support um, Broadband. Uh, CostQuest, um, in some of their work, um, indicated it would take somewhere around 61 billion um, to build the unserved rural areas uh, with fiber broadband. And that's just truly the unserved, not what is considered necessarily the underserved. Um, and, you know, we're looking back a couple of years in 2018, we know that the cost and demand for, for infrastructure build right now is, is increasing. Um, so, Looking at those numbers, we know we know there's a lot of uh, funding required to do it, and at some levels, we're just scratching the tip of the iceberg. In that, you know, we're we're really kind of looking at the foundation of residential and business broadband services, and and what about all the rest of of the network? So when we look at funding a little bit further, at least what is in play today. Um, just really quick, these are numbers we all should be fairly familiar with from CAF to, um, to ARDOF and then the, the two rounds of reconnect that have happened. There's a fair amount of money in the market and it looks like our U.S. is going to issue a round three of reconnect uh, sometimes next year. But in, in light of the numbers that we just had on the previous screen, you know, uh, these numbers start scratching the surface, but they still far short. And we know that, you know, these are, these are funding numbers that are going to be added to um, with other internal capital from companies that are looking at investments and other, you know, projects that, that may not require or that will go forward without, you know, any type of federal or state funding. But, you know, these are sig significant numbers and any of us that are, that are in the business of building infrastructure, we know these are long-lived networks. Um, and so when we're looking at 
um, the use cases for them are, you know, are we taking into account, obviously, uh, residential and business broadband services, transport, uh, all the things we've we've come to love and know. But as we look at at the future, you know, what kind of other services or requirements are we going to need on on these networks? And IoT is one of those burgeoning items that, you know, depend. And no matter if it's a a fiber network or a wireless network or any any type of infrastructure, you know, there's there can be you unique requirements or different requirements for um, implementing IoT services. So as we're looking at some of these planning uh, aspects of, of deploying networks here in the next several years, you know, in, in the funding timelines uh, from the programs on the previous slide, you know, we're looking realistically six to 10 years. Um, a lot can change in that time frame. So, uh, I love a valid quote from Alan Lakin is planning is bringing the future into the present so that you can actually do something about it now. And that was somewhat the impetus of, of working through this uh, with telecompetitor and Pete is what do we need to be thinking about in context of IoT uh, when it comes to network planning? Um, and, and when we think about that, it's things like what type of infrastructure connectivity might be required what are potential latency requirements? Is redundancy required? What kind of capacity? And what kind of security elements might we be looking for? And as we look at, at total cost of building these networks, um, you know, we know that if we go overboard, we can overcapitalize a project right now, but we have to also understand and think about um, what are those incremental costs in, in respect to forklift upgrades or overbuilds later uh, compared to maybe some minor incremental costs now that, that serve us well when we're realistically, you know, in the case of fiber networks, talking about a 30 plus year uh, asset. Wireless networks may be a little shorter long life, uh, but there are, you know, unique planning characteristics based on spectrum and capacity of systems as, as we look at that. Um, just a few notes specifically on, on fiber networks. Um, and, and again, most of these are, are, are pretty, I would say, common aspects that we all think about. But it, again, it takes uh, a little additional thought to be thinking about uh, IoT aspects for some of this, because some of it is maybe new ball games that we all haven't worked with. Um, you know, so just briefly, location is really uh, the geography, uh, what impact that, uh, that may have on the system at large, because that can also mean climate and temperature and moisture. Um, and, you know, in, in the event of a, a, a market that's next to an ocean, you know, we have a, a salinity factor to deal with. Um, what about the architecture? Is it flexible in nature? Um, can it be expanded? Uh, what does it take to expand it? And, he, and also access to the network. Um, is, there a, is there flexible access um, to actually be able to get to, to fiber assets uh, to, to most cost effectively um, augment those networks or add components? Um, considering the, the, the future technical needs of standards as we may know them today, and again, we know those evolve and change, but it's again a a best look at what we know. And probably one of the bigger things to look as we look forward is security. Um, and that can both be at the physical level, i.e. separate fibers and separate network systems essentially, and also at the logical level. And again, we know that's evolving, um, but again, understanding what we know today, um, future technical standards, and also a good measure of common sense based on you know, what we see in, in cybersecurity as, as we move forward. Um, when we're talking about some of the fixed mobile networks, again, geography and terrain for different reasons, um, depending on your spectrum, um, those can have wide and sometimes pretty substantial impacts on the ability to communicate. Um, and on spectrum, is it licensed or unlicensed? We have the ability to operate um, without interference from others. Um, what kind of vertical assets exist? Again, in rural America, um, you know, that can be co-located on major carrier tariffs, but 
in reality, that can become water towers, green legs, and other vertical assets. Um, again, depending on the, the spectrum and the requirements, um, you know, those are, those are things to be considering on, on how networks might be implemented and expanded. Uh, density, uh, the number of connections, again, depending on the technology and the vendor, um, you know, you can run into some issues uh, potentially with a number of devices in a, in a given sector. So it's one of those things to be cognizant of and when we're doing network planning. And then ultimately, um, you know, for either type of network, we're looking at backhaul because uh, a lot of the data from these IoT networks does head to the cloud. Um, whether that's a local cloud or even a more distributed cloud, there, there does have to be uh, connectivity to make this all happen. So last, last thing to consider here is, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, there's always financial considerations and impacts to everything we do. Um, and again, those are simply taking everything we know and evaluating current versus future costs. Um, are there uh, current or potentially future funder opportunities that could leverage uh, or could be leveraged because of the inclusion of, of IoT applications? Um, what additional generate or revenue generating opportunities might exist um, solely because of uh, new revenue opportunities that may exist because of sell, selling services or hosting them. And then there are the secondary impacts depending on, you know, a host of other variables that, you know, if you can implement cost savings, that means there's capital that can be uh, redistributed into other ventures. Um, and also, you know, if there's extra revenue generated or jobs, you know, there's definitely uh, the potential for positive local impacts. Again, some of those are maybe a little bit more nuanced, but again, it's all those things as we uh, watch the Internet of Things um, expand that, you know, we really need to keep uh, in the back of our mind. So I'm going to leave it there. Uh, and Pete is going to take us off into the world uh, of IoT. So IoT America is a managed service provider redefining the wireless IoT ecosystem. We work with carriers uh, and partners to boost access to data to make the data actionable. Because IoT is all about taking sensors from the remote point into the cloud through an analytics engine and making the data actionable so that you can make real time decisions. Okay, a uh, little bit about me. I have worked for a lot of major companies, including uh, Accenture, Samsung, EDS, Capgemini, uh, and have been doing IoT projects since approximately 2002. So I uh, have, have it, had a lot of experience working with a lot of uh, major industries on a lot of uh, seminal projects. Okay, moving forward into the next uh, slide, we're gonna talk about different use case uh, segments of IoT. Again, we're not gonna talk about um, home automation, home control, security systems. We're gonna talk about four segments of IoT that impact business. Um, and the first one, especially in rural America, is agriculture. Uh, the trends for agriculture are really compelling because the primary goal is to, is to increase yields, decrease loss, conserve resources. Some of the major points uh, in the places where IoT is impacting agriculture uh, is soil monitoring, whether you're looking at the moisture levels of the soil, the pH level of the soil, or the, nu or the nutrient levels of the soil. In case in point, we all take it for granted that farmers put down nitrogen to impact the crop. Well, nitrogen costs the farmer $200 an acre. Well, the issue with nitrogen is if you put it on too early or too late, you negatively impact the crop, either by reducing yields or burning out the seed. Um, if you put down uh, you know, too, middle, too little or too much, same thing happens. And the worst thing could happen is uh, water runoff, which causes a compliance issue with the EPA. 
by being able to effectively manage pH moisture nutrient levels, you can reduce the amount of fertilizer you use as well as increase your yields. Same thing with asset tracking. On a large agricultural installation, you know, the ability to find uh, tractors and vehicles and farm equipment are easily uh, accelerated by the use of sensors on the equipment. And then from a tank monitoring perspective, every large farm and ranch has tanks and water troughs and silos that uh, they go forward and use for storage. Diesel tank for the tractors and the farm implements, propane tanks, of course, for uh, a lot of the heating and processing, and of course, water troughs, especially on a ranch. Uh, I happened to be in, um, in North Dakota uh, last year, and I uh, heard a very tragic story where a farmer, a rancher, excuse me, had uh, gone on vacation and um, filled their 36 water troughs. Well, they had a heat wave while they're on vacation, and when the rancher came back, he came back to 200 dead cows. And the cows, of course, sell for $2,000 a cow, so it's almost a half a million dollar loss. With a very inexpensive sensor on the water troughs, they could actually go and say, that one's empty, and please go refill it. The use case is, is very compelling. If we go to the next you know, slide on agriculture, you know, ah, I went too fast. Um, you know, we talk about irrigation. We talk, of, again, the crop management, and we talk about the maintenance. Um, irrigation, of course, is a major topic in agriculture, insofar as with irrigation, um, many, many, many municipal entities are you know, monitoring and increasing the cost of water. Many farms, of course, use wells. Municipalities are now taxing water runoff. So by using an irrigation system, you can actually use less water and increase your yield. And then of course, from maintenance uh, and procurement activities, you know, managers can actually go forward and, and look at utilization and, and actually predict the wear and tear on their equipment. You know, the next slide, which you'll see, um, we talk, I'm gonna talk about two different types of IoT technologies. One is low powered wide area network. And of course, you'll see here, these are use cases that you'll be able to go forward and, and look at with regard to deploying IoT if you choose to do that. One of the real benefits of low powered wide area network is it's for applications that really need small packet connectivity, that are really tolerant of latency and really have the ability to go forward and you know, just report one or two things at a time, you know, a couple of times a day. You know, things that don't move, things that aren't criti critical, things that, you know, that don't shoot video are excellent for low power to wide area network. If you look at things like 5G, and of course Wi-Fi falls into this realm as well, um, you're now starting talking about IoT for in more industrial applications. Telemedicine, you know, with COVID-19, telemedicine has become a really big um, concern in, uh, in rural America. Rural hospitals have closed down at a very precipitous rate over the last five years. Um, and now, uh, with the advent of uh, really robust telemedicine platforms, good network is required to go forward and deliver better healthcare situations to the people in rural areas. Um, in farming, a lot of trends for drone support uh, to go forward in pest and weed uh, eradication. Connectivity gaps also work in autonomous vehicles. You know, we all talk about autonomous cars, but the number one segment for autonomous vehicles in IoT at this point happen to be tractors. The ability to go forward and have autonomous tractors planting, cutting, reaping, seeding, um, absolutely drive, you know, large economies of scale. And candidly, the biggest implement obstacle for any farmer is night. With an autonomous vehicle, tractors can run 24 hours a day. Of course, video solutions are, are tangible everywhere. And um, with regard to uh, gaps in the pasture, is, you know, high speed, uh, high-speed connectivity will go forward and deliver better yields and conservation of resources. So next, we're gonna talk about smart towns. 
So on many webinars, you hear people talking about smart cities. Well, candidly, small towns and small counties and, and rural states want the same type of advantages that large towns like Los Angeles, Chicago, Dallas, or New York have. Right. They want to be able to go and have intelligent building structures, public safety solutions, parking, lighting and waste collection. Right. The ability to locate equipment is very important. Right. Um, over a large expanse, um, the, the ability to go and track where your assets are, um, you know, can, can save hours a day of man time. Um, the ability to go forward and, and do municipal sweeps again, provides you know, really important services. Um, forecasting disruptions in your processes, right? By the ability to track the data, you know, managers and towns can go forward and, and make really good business decisions. I mean, one of the really big um, use cases that we've seen is um, actually trash pickup. By being able to put sensors in trash cans to know whether they're full or not, you know, city managers can go forward and actually plan better routes for municipal waste. So you don't have to go forward and visit a trash can that's empty, yet you can go immediately when the trash can is full. Um, really efficient use of time. And, and, you know, time is, of course, one of the big use cases and value propositions that IoT uh, saves. And again, we, we talked about managing maintenance, per, uh, maintenance and procurement activities. Okay, land management. In every municipal uh, entity, there are public grounds. Just like in agriculture, irrigation and soil health is important there too. The sports fields, the park fields, arboretums, um, managed irrigation, very important. It goes without saying that IoT in buildings is, is, very, uh, is a very trendy use case as well. The ability to go forward and you know predictively turn on HVAC systems, monitor their use, as well as monitor building occupancy, right? So if the building is occupied, then you turn on the you know the HVAC. If the building is unoccupied, you go to an idle state. It also helps with lighting, and of course, you can also manage the air quality. Um, that's also becoming very important in the COVID-19 world. Uh, we talked about waste management, but one thing I didn't talk about was dumpsters, because dumpsters and municipal trash cans have the same profile. And of course, with regard to traffic and lighting, you know, traffic management is very important. Now, you might say that, okay, it's a small town, we have six traffic lights. Well, at that point, you still have the smart lights, the smart meters, as well as parking meters as well that you can manage in one system and you know, remotely change them based on time of day, day of week, conditions, school year, whatnot, um, all have very effective capabilities and sensors have the ability to go forward and, and provide a lot of relevance. The next use case we're gonna talk about is education. This is really important nowadays. Um, carriers, broadband carriers, rural telephone carriers, wireless carriers are all significantly impact by the ability of broadband delivery, okay? Uh, broadband to the home is now not a nice to have, it's a must have, especially with remote learning. Uh, as an example today, um, broadband is enabling this uh, video conference, okay? Interactive whiteboards, uh, access to school databases, remote attendance systems. Um, there are a lot of educational systems now from an IoT perspective that actually use cameras to monitor eye contact um, to, to make sure that you're not looking away from the screen when you're testing or attendance systems. Um, all of these are IoT and all of these are exceptionally important. And then lastly, of course, you know, and this is by no means uh, you know, uh, an end all be all list, but these are four topics that we're gonna to talk to so that we can go forward and, and you know, drive to questions. IoT health. Um, again, as we said, I said earlier, you know, telemedicine is exceptionally important. Um, and some of the uh, 
some of the use cases are, are spectacular. Uh, reducing emergency room waiting times. You know, being able to put sensors into you know hospitals to effectively uh, track patients um, can actually reduce the waiting time. And this is really important when we're talking about uh, you know prospective uh, you know patients with uh, infectious disease. Okay, the ability to track occupancy um, in a hospital or in a healthcare clinic or a medical clinic, of course, is also very important. Um, and then, of course, the ability to go and, um, you know, to, to monitor the individual needs of the patients is paramount. Remote health monitoring, right? The ability to minimize, you know, visits to the hospital. You know, some people in America now have to travel 150 miles to the nearest hospital. Okay, the ability to go and, and, and if you need to have standard blood tests for diabetes or renal failure or, you know, you know congestive heart failure, you know, this, this, this is a burden that you don't need. By, by enabling sensors, you know, to take pulse ox and pulse and heart rate and heart rhythm and, you know, glucose levels, um, you minimize costs you maximize results and you have instantaneous evaluation, okay? So you enable both the medical provider to go and provide better medical services and you enable the patient to have better results. And then of course, the availability of, of you know, of critical outages, right? You know, a lot of systems in hospitals can't afford to fail. You know, power outages, you know, asset locations, um, all impacted and can be helped by IoT. Uh, one of the big problems with medical facilities, especially large ones, is uh, they might have one or two portable x-ray machines, right? Or they might have a few EKG machines, right, throughout the facility. Well, many times, and this is also very troubling, People are on mad dashes to locate them because they don't know where they are. IoT enabled healthcare allows you to go forward and track the asset and actually geofence it in the facility to map it to know where it is, so you can quickly go and you know recover the the asset required. I mean, this type of capability has real impact and has the ability to help people save lives. The last on is health. Uh, last slide on health, we're going to talk about tracking patients, okay? We talked about assets, but, you know, it's good to know where the doctors are and the nurses and the orderlies and the staff, all of the hardware as well. You know, one of the things that IoT enables is the ability to go forward and, you know, know where your patients are and make sure that the right patient is the right patient you're working on because many hospital accidents happen by giving wrong medicines to the wrong patients. And uh, we've all heard of the very few cases where, you know, surgical procedures have, you know, transpired on, on somebody that it wasn't intended to. Um, drug management. The ability to manage drugs is really exciting um, from an IoT perspective. You know, the ability to go and, and, and track expiration dates and locations and temperatures. So a word has it that in 2021, we're going to be deploying, you know, hundreds of millions of doses of vaccine. And in that case, the vaccines are all very critically managed to temperature and date. From an IoT perspective, many drug companies are working on schema to go forward and make sure that in the supply chain, that the temperature is main, maintained consistently so that we can ensure that uh, we get max, maximum effectiveness through the drugs. And of course, chronic disease. You know, from a cost of healthcare perspective, the number one cost of healthcare is managing chronic illness. Um, the ability to go forward and utilize wearable technology from an IoT perspective to monitor personal health actually drives down healthcare costs. So the, the complete need for delivering IoT to the healthcare provider is, you know, is, is very significant and impactful. The last slide I'm going to talk about today is something that whenever we go on an IoT journey, 
we must start with this. In the middle of our IoT journey, we have to consider this. And at the end of our IoT journey, we always have to go forward and look back. And that's security. When we design an IoT system, we have to go forward and make sure that it's as secure as we can make it. And some of the criteria and characteristics that we have to look at uh, include encryption and points of, points of entry, as well as um, the ability to encase and encapsulate the data that we, we uh, send through the network. So when we design an IoT network, we must always start with looking at how secure the edge is, right? The sensor, how, how, are, how are we taking the data that the sensor is retrieving, whether it be a, a, a pH sensor in the ground or you know, a 4K video feed, and how are we making sure that that is not being compromised? How is the encryption working? How is the containerization working? And these are considerations we have to look at. Next, when we take IoT data from the edge and take it to a, a collaboration point, a gateway per se, you know, we have to go forward and make sure that the transfer of the data between the two devices are secure. Um, and that might be, a, 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 you know, using a 256-bit encryption AES uh, uh, schema and algorithm. It may be using a, uh, a containerization. It may be looking at device keys. But we need to go forward and make sure that we are um, very secure, taking data from the edge to the gateway, and then from the gateway, the same manner to the cloud. So we also have to then at that point, look at the database and the, the uh, storage security as well, and, and understanding how we're accessing the data. Applications are also another place where security needs to go forward and be, uh, be introspective. We must go forward and look at all the ways that an application can be accessed, either from the front door or as well as the back door accesses. Um, we should never, ever, ever discount physical security because most security breaches start, you know, from a physical per perspective, right? You know, someone didn't make a switch. Someone didn't key something in. Someone didn't lock a door. Um, physical security is always something to look at. Um, one of the things with regard to physical security is process compliance, right? Um, the vast majority of security breaches happen because good employees who have all of the tools and the, uh, and the capabilities to provide good security don't follow the rules. Um, you know, the, one of the very famous breaches was, of course, the Target breach, which um, was, was valued at over a billion dollars of impact. Um, Target had a security team. Target had good security tools. They had training. The issue at hand is not all the processes were followed, not all the logs were read, and thus they, they incurred a breach. Lastly, we always have to make sure that we're, we're taking into consideration the compliance standards that are impactful to our, to our, um, you know, to, to our industry. If it's medical or healthcare, we always have to look at HIPAA. PCI from a financial perspective, and of course, everything should be going and uh, be cross-referenced to the NIST cybersecurity framework that is uh, provided by the federal government. Um, security is important in IoT. Uh, IoT, uh, and again, it's been projected, uh, McKinsey has said by 2025, there'll be 50 billion connected devices, and we're well on our way. Um, IoT is going to be, you know, seminal and impactful for industry and for all our lives, but we have to make sure that we um, practice safe IoT.